Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished colleagues, uh, dear participants, we will be shortly starting the webinar. We are giving two minutes for participants to settle down and thanks for your patience and participation. We'll be back soon. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining this, this webinar. Um, my name is Yunus Arikan. I'm the Director of Global Advocacy at ICLE Local Governments for Sustainability. And I'm also acting as the, the focal point of local governments and the municipal authorities constituency to the UNFCC. This is the official coordination body for networks of local and regional governments in their interaction with the UN climate change processes. Um, today we are having our 14th monthly webinar towards COP26. Um, these webinars are held every month around the third week. Uh, and this is particularly a, a webinar which aims to provide updates on how local and regional governments are preparing for the uh, climate conference in Glasgow this year, at the end of the year in November, and especially also agendas, processes relevant for us, our engagement, uh, updates from the previous, uh, so the latest updates since the last webinar we had, uh, any new agenda upcoming, and also a review of our strategies and our roadmap. Um, this session is recorded uh, and published on the ICLEI's YouTube channel. Uh, and the, the presentation is also made available afterwards. Um, during the session, we recommend all the attendees to listen on the mode in order to ensure a smooth flow of the, the session. The, the presentation this time will be only delivered by me. In previous sessions, we had colleagues joining us, guest speakers, but this time I will be the only speaker. So I'm planning to run the whole presentation in maximum 30 minutes. Uh, maybe 35, um, uh, and I would like to give the floor then for interventions, contributions from our partners, participants. Um, I see a number of familiar colleagues uh, that have been joining our webinars as part of their engagement in the, the LGMA uh, constituency or the, the extended family of the LGMA. I, I thank for them, uh, their inter interest, and I also would like to welcome all colleagues who are joining for the first time. Um, so with this, uh, let's if you like start uh, to go through the agenda for today. Um, as as our tradition, we would like to uh, recap uh, our, our our basics of UNFCC advocacy and who is who in this process. Uh, beyond us, uh, it's mainly the the presidency and secretariat. Uh, I'd like to provide a couple of updates on the virtual engagement that is becoming now more uh, important, and I must confess more complex than ever. Uh, and um, we would uh, cover what has been achieved uh, over the past couple of weeks. Our last webinar was on the 17th of February. Uh, since then, there were a number of um, announcements, um, launches, releases, events, uh, and some, some updates. So we will go through that. Um, with that in mind, I would like to recall our roadmap. Uh, and this time I would like to highlight some game changers in the process that I think is really now 
uh, making it even more exciting to to engage in the process because we are seeing concrete evidences that that we can make sure the COP in Glasgow could be a multi-level action COP. Therefore, uh, I'm I'm really excited for that agenda. Um, we will take you through or at least share some of the updates from the the applications to the UK government's COP26 um, green and blue zones. Um, we will go through once again the COP26 planning, some 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 updates, and we will also refresh our, our, our agenda because some of the events, the dates are clarified. Uh, some of them are now much more visible um, and then we will highlight the importance of those uh, as appropriate. So, um, Paris Agreement is important. It is important because it opens a new era in, in global action. Uh, it is important because it has a universal, let's say, coverage on three main aspects. First of all, it is, uh, it is, it is the business of everyone. That's the multi-level and multi-stakeholder approach. It is not anymore on the national arms, and it is not only anymore a group of parties like in the Kyoto Protocol for taking priority responsibility. All parties into the Paris Agreement and all partners have a role. Second, it has a very ambitious 1.5 degree goal. Um, this is significantly important because it defines for the first time our ultimate goal. And obviously, climate neutrality is a, a very important intermediate target. By the mid-century, we should make sure climate neutrality is achieved in terms of our emissions, but also removals. And actually, in order to reach this 1.5 goal, we have to even re remove more um, um, emissions of GHGs uh, than at the moment we're releasing so that we have to expand our uh, sinks, uh, be it ocean, be it uh, green spaces. Um, what does it mean? Uh, and what is the important now? National governments, uh, let's remember all the current NDCs, the, the first ones, they were all prepared before Paris Agreement was adopted. So none of them relate themselves to these principles. Therefore, none of them fit for Paris Agreement. That is the reason why we are asking every nation, every nation to bring a new NDC. And this has to be developed or defined and agreed at home before COP26. So the success of Glasgow depends on work at home. Second, for local and regional governments, we have a preamble paragraph 15, which recognizes the importance of engagement of all levels of government, which this means that climate action, which we as local and regional have been doing over the past 20 years or so on a voluntary basis, is not anymore a voluntary task. It is our core duty. Therefore, it has to be reflected every council decision, every strategic plan of any administration, and the climate neutrality goals should be part of our urban development strategies. Other stakeholders, obviously, from civil society to business, from youth to indigenous people, everyone has to step up. And, and we also make sure, have to make sure that the benefits of a new world being designed should be uh, shared by all so that it is not just on the technology developers. It's not just those who keep this, these control of these new um, policies or, or, or products, but every member of the society those even who are who would relatively get a, a certain disadvantage because they have to change their jobs they have to change their practices they should benefit as well if we don't get on get on board we will not be able to make a just transition these are the, the elements of why we are excited for Paris agreement is who um i see just um so Tala Karis, uh, yes, we will send the link after the webinar is over. Just maybe to remind, uh, this webinar will be repeated at 4 p.m. in German time once again for those in the Western Hemisphere. So be, bear with us, but you'll receive the, the recording um, after this webinar uh, tomorrow by the latest Friday. So um, who is who in the in the Paris Agreement? Um, this is a cyclic process. Every year, the national governments convene and they choose uh, a national government who would lead the process. This is basically defined by the regional groups of the world. So it's, it's uh, Europeans, Africans, Asians, and it's a rotation every year. Uh, traditionally, the country who hosts is the political representative or leader. But over the past years, we have seen changes like Fiji was host, Fiji was the political presidency, but Germany was the host. Uh, and in 2019, we have seen Chile was the political leader, but Madrid was the host and Spain was the host. So today, as of today, the party who has started to host this uh, is taking the responsibility until the next COP. So as of today, all decisions, the implementation, the, the safeguarding of all the elements, 
of the outcomes from COP25 under, is under the responsibility of the Chilean government as the president of COP, Minister of Environment, and we have uh, Gonzalo Munoz as the Halal champion. We have an incoming presidency. It is uh, the UK government, and we have a full-time uh, president designate Alok Sharma since the beginning of the year. He has teamed up with a, an impressive list of advisors, um, and, and there is uh, there is an impressive number of um, consultative bodies that the UK government has created because their principle is that to achieve the the most inclusive COP. So we have seen unique models like Friends of COP, uh, advisory bodies in the UK stakeholders, but also uh, regular consultations for constitutional focal points. So in that sense, UK um, is taking a prominent leadership and they're also working closely with Italy as the free COP. Every year in between these two COPs, traditionally there was a meeting in Bonn at the seat of the Secretariat. Uh, Obviously, this is not taking place. Uh, therefore, several virtual sessions have taken place, and we'll see how this will evolve over the next couple of months. Uh, we will come back to that in the discussion session. Um, so I have kept this uh, slide again. This was in the previous agendas, but this will be backed up with an additional slide now. So this is a traditional way when we are prepared ourselves that there will be a physical meeting at least twice in a year, or there will be workshops in the year, and we, we participate there, we present our submissions, uh, send our documents, or host side events, summits, and then interact with the parties and workshops. And we have our own priorities, every COP, and this year we have our multi-level action COP as a strategy, and the presidency also, their, their, their priorities, obviously. But this is a traditional now. What we are living now is in a virtual advocacy, the virtual meaning that at the moment, there's no negotiation taking place, but numerous meetings are taking place thanks to the technology and, and thanks to the interest of all the partners. Um, and in, I, I, that, that's what make, making things a bit complicated because despite there are numerous discussions, there are no decisions. Meanwhile, because of this diversity of the meetings, there is also a, a plethora of processes, agendas, even registration formats, uh, which is making our lives a bit harder, I must confess. And in, in my capacity as the focal point, I am struggling to follow all of it. And of course, trying to introduce you or share with you through our regular mailings. But what we can see as a, let's say, bird's eye view, we have a group of sessions that is now conducted by the NFC Secretariat, that is uh, subsidiary bodies, they have their regular meetings. In, in parallel to the UNFCC process or part of the subsidiary body meetings, we also have other bodies like uh, Climate Technology Advisory Board or, or Warsaw Mechanism, um, Capacity Building for Paris Agreement. So there are numerous bodies, they also have their own workshops and they also have different procedures for registration and quotas for our access. Meanwhile, presidency is, of course, with all its, its responsibility, is mobilizing the process. So what is going on now, they have made a list of presidential consultations for every month now. That's taking place every month. We have a now list of uh, all these sessions. The dates are not fixed, um, but the themes are defined. But the, the important is that these are, at the moment, as of today, are open for parties only. The, the, the access to these meetings are not open for observers. Obviously, this is creating a concern by constituencies, the youth, the, the business, trade unions, all the nine constituencies and other partners. We, as constituency focal points, are doing our best to convince the Bureau of the COP25, the presidencies and the secretary to open this uh, process as, as possible to, to the observers. Um, we are submitting some letters and, and we're trying to influence this process. Um, we hope there will be moments where we will be also be interacting, but at the moment, the doors are closed to us. Let's be realistic. Uh, there's a second group of uh, activities that the presidencies are leading, especially the UK presidency. Um, they have their own campaigns. If you recall the first slide, they have five themes. Let's recall these five themes. Adaptation and resilience, nature, energy transition, in transport and finance. These are the five teams. They have several campaigns for all these five teams. Meanwhile, UK presidency was also trying to influence the political agenda by some high level events. You have seen 
And last year we had this climate ambition summit uh, in the end of uh, December on the anniversary of Paris Agreement. This was a collaborative of France, UK, and the UN Secretary General. Um, this year we had climate action, adaptation summit with with Netherlands uh, and and also the parties. So the next one, the next big event is the climate and uh, climate and development ministerial. Uh, that will mainly focus on the vulnerable countries. It is not a pledge event, but it is mainly to discuss how we can or how the global community can accommodate the expectations and the needs of, of developing countries, in particular the vulnerable communities for finance, access to technical support. Um, uh, there is a, a, a unique process because it's in the prerogative of the presidency. They do not have to bind themselves with the constituency. They have selected special partners, they have made some consortiums. These consortiums have had some workshops, some 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 conf uh, some roundtables. Uh, we are still trying to understand how local and regional governments were invited. Uh, we have, were, were invited to only observe one of them. And for the meeting on the 31st of March, we are still informed that we will be observing, but we are all hoping that there will be also speakers. And in case any of our partners in the LGMA constituency who are participating in this process, feel free to update us. So this is the presidential event. We said that there's a UNHCC process and in the middle, there is also a huge agenda, which is under the Marrakesh Partnership, the High Level Climate Action Champions that are mobilizing a huge uh, effort in terms of race to zero, race to resilience, race to breakthroughs. No, uh, what was the name for the breakthroughs? Um, let me recall. Yeah, race to zero breakthroughs. This is mainly the sectoral uh, process and the, the pathways that we are working on. Um, I'm happy ICLE is engaged in all of this in, in its capacity, but we also have other partners uh, engaged, especially Race to Zero has a cities campaign for the Race to Resilience. There's another cities campaign is becoming a part of it. And so this is a very dynamic uh, world. It has been, of course, because of the nature, it's much more inclusive, uh, much more interactive. Uh, and then we are able to hear more updates uh, through the partners involved, but also from the secretary. So that is the virtuality of the process. Um, so let's focus on uh, what did we observe since 17th of February when the last time we met in our webinar. Um, so first of all, um, the uh, this is a calendar, uh, let's say, according to calendar, uh, sequence of the calendar. Um, by the time we had our webinar, actually, there was an impressive event by Tokyo Metropolitan Government. It was announced as Tokyo Time to Act. Tokyo is one of the front runners on, on climate ambition. Uh, and, and it was an impressive event uh, with uh, high level participants, speakers, uh, high level champions. Um, on this, around the same date, Commonwealth Local Government Forum, one of the partners of the LGMA, also announced their urbanization call, especially for the Commonwealth Forum, uh, which is the, the the second largest coalition or the second largest uh, agglomeration of national governments after the UN. Uh, this is the UK oriented Commonwealth Group. Uh, the Commonwealth Local Government Forum is a is a unique body that brings both ministers but also local governments. So they are uh, our voice there and they have announced a call for urbanization. We will touch this on the agenda, uh, which will be the forum of a Commonwealth Summit uh, in June in Kigali. Um, a week after, there was an important UN Security Council debate. There was no speakers from local governments. It was purely heads of state. Um, but of course, the recognition at that level is, is helping our course uh, or help, helping our cause of, of ambitious action. Uh, a day after, the Italian pre-COP uh, leadership uh, hosted a virtual, virtual summit. They had this Youth for Climate events over the past few months. And their conclusion was, to connect youth with local action. And, and that was impressive because there were two impressive uh, urban leaders, mayor of Milan, who is the host of uh, this year's uh, number of events, uh, including Urban 20 together with uh, Rome, uh, but also they are the host of the PICOP. So they have a natural responsibility of leadership. And we're also aware Milan is very active in C40 and they're, they're front runner on, on response to recovery as well. But he was assisted with another leader, which is the mayor of Recife. Uh, he is uh, he has a unique uh, also, uh, let's say, 
track record. Uh, Recife is the first Brazilian city who had declared climate emergency, and they also adopted climate neutrality targets for 2050. And the city is just elected a couple of months ago, uh, Brazil's first or Brazil's youngest mayor, Jose Carpao, um, is, is 28 years old, and he was attending this event. It was an impressive dynamic, and the youth were praising the both of these mayors, and we are very, very happy that this will give us a lot of opportunities to provide more input to the PCOP in, in, in end of September. On the 25th of February, the Bureau, the, the 11 national government representatives, mainly representing their regional, let's say, priorities, they had their closed meeting. This is regularly held. Uh, and there was an expectation of to of, for them to announce a, a strategy about how to kick off virtual negotiations because, yes, COVID is, is still an, an issue, but action is taking place at, at home, and we don't have the luxury to, to further delay uh, global action on, on climate. Uh, and in fact, it's even more important because the, the recovery and climate action should go hand in hand in order to make sure we make a true a transformative change. So uh, there was even a, an invitation from the UN Secretary General a, a month before uh, for them to, to consider virtual negotiations. However, they couldn't agree. Uh, they were not able to clarify many questions raised or, or concerns raised by many governments, especially the challenges of virtual uh, negotiations in terms of participation in different time zones. Um, uh, we know there are several UN processes are already implementing such virtual negotiations. However, at the climate process, it is not decided yet. So we're still in a no negotiation moment. However, that's not the end of the process. There is another meeting coming up. So, but this is what we, where we are as of today. Uh, meanwhile, uh, GIZ, an important uh, partner in the community of LGMA, the German development um, institution, um, they have released a, a paper on multi-level action. Uh, UNFCC released a synthesis report saying that existing NDCs are only resulting in 1% reduction whereas we need 46% reduction by 2030. It was a, like a wake up call. Um, regional climate weeks kicked off. Uh, we were proud that local government and municipal authority were represented. Uh, this was again held in two zone, time zones, UCL Africa and uh, Argentinian uh, network of um, municipalities acting on climate change. They were speaking at the highest level, which was really good because it was a multi-stakeholder process. On the 5th of March, there was a, a busy day. A lot of applications went through. We will go to that one for the UK zones. Um, on the 8th of March, the biodiversity, which is the sister process uh, parallel to climate change as part of the Rio conventions, they released an important document. I will go to it in for more details, but this is one of those game changers, we call it. On the 15th of March, the UK government, uh, the presidency, COP26 presidency, as part of their cities and regions advisory council had their second meeting with their uh, metropolitan uh, and, and urban leaders. Um, this was a closed meeting, um, but we are we are hearing that especially once the, the local election is done in, in the UK, things will speed up, but we're also aware uh, there are some preparations like UK 100 are one of our partner network to convene a net zero leader summit in, in the summertime. 17th of March was remarkable for, for LGMA. We had a Zero Carbon City Forum hosted by Japanese Minister of Environment in collaboration with UNFCC, IGES, and ICLE. We will go to details of it on the same day. The Coalition for Urban Transition, another partner of the, the local governments and municipal authorities constituency, they released their flagship report for COP26, which is trying to map how national governments could support local governments with a specific focus on six countries. China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, Mexico, and South Africa. Um, and there will be throughout the way, uh, on the way towards COP, um, there will be national reports or regional consultations. Uh, so we hope this will shake the ground in terms of in convincing national governments for more collaborative action. On the 18th of March, uh, the day after, there was also a release of the, the Renewables in Cities report by REN21. Uh, which also created a huge, um, uh, let's say, um, awareness on, on how local governments can drive 100% renewable transformation in their heating, cooling, uh, and, and even mobility uh, systems as well. So this was uh, 
uh, a chronology of the past three or four weeks. I mean, thinking that February is shorter, <laughs> it's more or less three to four weeks. Um, so here we are. Um, we would like to recall once again um, the strategy we announced in December 2019 in, in, in uh, Madrid as the LGMA roadmap. We believe it's becoming more and more valuable the, the 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 coverage the themes and the priorities of this roadmap if you look at the whole agenda evolving it's becoming more and more important that we act on all elements of this roadmap let's recall we are having seven pillars and the eighth pillar is the mobilization the seventh pillars we are trying to break it down according to three main process that one related to paris agreement one related to climate action independent from Paris Agreement. And the third is to expand the climate community and reach out to the, 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 the daily life of our citizens, especially through climate justice and social equity. I will not go into all the details, but I would like to announce, or I would like to re highlight that, in fact, over the past couple of days, we are seeing some breakthrough game changers for this agenda. These are three main game changers. The first one on the 22nd of April, this is traditional and Earth Day celebration, which is a primarily an, a, a legacy of the United States uh, and their, their citizens uh, 50 years ago. But this is now celebrated by every all around the world. And also uh, it's also announced as a, as a Mother Earth Day by the UN. But the importance is that the new federal administration, federal government of the United States under Biden and Harris, and with their special climate envoy, John Kerry, and their national um, advisor, uh, Gina Makati, they have already announced that on the 22nd of April, there will be a US second national determined contribution. There will be, a, they are calling it US or Biden summit, but there will be a heads of state meeting in the US. Um, this is particularly giving us uh, an excitement because there are more and more signals that there may be a, a strong reference to the local and regional governments, cities and states and counties into the US NDC. Um, this has been discussed by the US uh, mayors and governors and US networks uh, that there's a huge uh, mobilization there. They are they're in touch with the federal government almost on a daily basis, but it is not just the US. Um, we will see that there is also interactions with other governments, for example, Japan is also very seriously discussing this. So. We are expecting that the US NDC can be uh, and elevate the whole discussion about multi level action into a new height. And that will definitely change the rules of the game. And if someone is running faster, there may be more encouragement for others. And it may not be that it's only them on the 22nd of April, there may be more announcements from national governments. Therefore, um, this is why we're excited. Second game changer on the biodiversity front. We have a, a conclusion from the Edinburgh process. I will go into a bit more details. The good news is that this is presented by the UK government and Scotland's government collectively to the Biodiversity Secretariat. It is an official process and it is opening, uh, elevating the existing statu quo, which is we already have an action plan for citizens of nations in the biodiversity and they are trying to extend it for 2030. But this could inspire many processes in the climate change. And the third, um, this has been an, an effort that we are, as ICLE and LGMA focal point, have been asking for a while, as you have seen in the LGMA roadmap. We are calling for a new way of engagement to, so that we can consider an urbanization ministerial at COP. This could happen for the first time. For a long time, the climate committee is discussing with ministers of energy, ministers of finance, ministers of agriculture, transport. We want to have an interaction with the ministers of urbanization or urban issues related public works, interior, or, or, or um, uh, ministers of housing. If this could happen, this could be uh, introducing a totally new discussion, both to the negotiations, but also the action agenda. And the good news is that during the Japan forum, the deputy executive director of UN Habitat announced publicly for the first time that UN Habitat is also embracing this agenda, this idea. And we are very, very excited because having a support from the UN institution will definitely help us a lot. And we're also in touch with the United Nations Environment Program, United Nations Development Program as well as part of our overall engagement uh, since last year um, 
therefore, we are pretty excited that this would be creating a new uh, opportunity and momentum for us. Um, um, this is uh, the, uh, I mean, I've looked at the past couple of weeks, but for us, that was the most important event of the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, you can see here the impressive lineup by John Kerry, Minister Koizumi, Patricia Spinoza, an Im immense list of uh, local and some national leaders across the world demonstrating their ambition and, and announcing their commitments. Um, the, it was a two days event. Um, and at the end of the day, there was uh, also some summary results. Uh, it's the Minister of Environment who will take it forward. Um, but I think, especially with uh, the relation with the UN agencies, as I said, UN Habitat was there as well. A number of uh, partners were there as well. It will give us a confidence that we will be running faster with this new spirit of multi-level action. And Japan is one of those who are demonstrating this, this one at its best. Uh, this gives one example of why Japan is so important. Uh, you may recall in every webinar we are repeating that Japan is running an interesting model. Minister of Minister Koizumi has been working very hard to convince local and regional government cities and prefectures to convince them for climate neutrality. And as of today, 300, more than 300 cities and prefectures representing more than 100 million people, around 80% of Japanese population, have committed to climate neutrality by 2050. With this, in October, Japanese government, prime minister, announced its climate neutrality target. And now the Japan government is in the making of their NDC, and this forum, therefore, was particularly very important. And as a preparation to this forum, it was remarkable to see the YouTube channel of Japanese prime minister that there is a, a short video of the local government's climate and charter goals, but this shows that it is not anymore a Minister of Environment issue. At the highest level, Prime Minister of Suga is aware of Japanese climate neutrality targets can only be reached with local and regional governments. That is the most powerful driving force in the country. And that's why what Japan will follow will be a remarkable demonstration for all the others. The Edinburgh process, here is what we are, 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 are mentioning about the text. As, as we said, this is officially a UN uh, document. It's not anymore a position paper from the networks. It is an official UN document. And how this was happened? Because it was the UK government who have submitted this. And how did they do it? Because it was the Scottish government who hosted the Edinburgh process in collaboration with local governments and regional networks like ICLEI, Regions for Committee of the Regions, uh, and, and many others. So this is a unique example how a UN process could be inspired or expanded through this kind of a multi-stakeholder, multi-level approach. This is now being on the table. There is a concrete proposal for a decision for an action plan. A plan of action is already available. Therefore, what could happen in the CBD would be very, very exemplary for us. Uh, and, and even better news is that they will come in before COP so the wind coming from Kunming, if it reaches to Glasgow, we can expect at least an inspiration in Glasgow as well. Let's be realistic. This is an agenda that has been implemented since 2008 in the Biodiversity Convention. So we cannot expect the same level of engagement in the, or recognition in this UNFCC process. But it's clear uh, that, that uh, this can give us a good precedence. And, for years, we have been working for such a precedence. And the fact that the biodiversity and Edinburgh process is led by UK and Scotland, and since they are the host of COP26, is an extremely important opportunity that we can benefit, we can, we can make use of. Um, so last couple of minutes, and then I will stop and receive input from all the partners. Uh, I see some additional questions are also coming. Um, Holger has just put a, a question. Um, how is ICLEI responding to Japan's view on nuclear power, part of their climate control portfolio? Um, Holger, I, now, since it's a timely question, maybe let's go back to it. Um, Holger, if you look at this video, it's a three-minute video. Um, by the way, Holger is our colleague from ICLEI, European Secretary. I don't know, Tala Karis, you can type your name uh, or his institution because I'm not familiar with your, your name. Sorry for the... the the lack of information. So um, what we are very happy that in this video, 
you would see the efforts on renewable energy, complete renewable energy. In this video, there is no reference to nuclear energy in relation to local government commitments to climate neutrality. That is what I can say. Obviously, a national government or a prime minister document can have more elements, but we don't know yet. But so far, we haven't heard anything, which is making, of course, ICLE is, is, is being those institutions who have been encouraging the phase out of nuclear and fossil fuels for, for years. The way the Japanese prime minister's office presenting the zero carbon cities and prefectures is per perfect for us, but I cannot speak about the other part of the story. Let's see. That's why the NDC preparation is so important. And the good news, um, if you go to the recording of the sessions of the Japan Forum, they are already established uh, governors and mayors task force as a council. So they are interacting frequently with the Minister of Environment, which is now Minister of Climate Change. So they are doing their best to defend or put their position. Obviously, there's another group of lobbying and, and sector. They will do their own efforts and we'll see who, who convinces. We are confident that the national government should not ignore the voices of 80% of their population. Uh, therefore, we believe the proposals will find their way, but I cannot comment on the other proposals at this stage at least. So uh, that was a break and thanks for the question once again. Um, expressions of interest are gone to the UK government. They will have time to review. Here is the first information. It's impressive. The numbers are impressive. Thousands, and I mean thousands, meaning something between 1,001 to 9,000. So somewhere in between that they have received applications on these five themes for two weeks. Out of these hundreds, which is between 100 to 900, and it's coming to the middle range, hundreds of applications have been sent with a focus on cities and built environment. And tens, when I say tens, it is up to 99. That's the number of applications have been sent by cities and regions and their networks across the world, be it Manchester, be it Bristol, be it Sao Paulo, be it um, um, any Tokyo or African city. So as of today, of course, ICLEI is not involved in this process, it's purely under the prerogative of the UK government. We're in touch daily with our, our partners or focal points. Um, this is the information we can share publicly, uh, the rest of the details in their hands. What we have been tracking, uh, you may recall, uh, we have opened a, a Google document. We have asked our colleagues to fill in this information. What we know as of today, there is around 25 applications sent, minimum 25, I think it can even reach 30, by uh, our members or partners of the LGMA community. So, so you can see that this around, if it is a hundred, around one third came from the LGMA family. So congratulations, uh, and, and it's really an impressive mobilization. How many of them will be eligible to be selected? We don't know, it will take time, and especially it will be depending on the physical conditions, of course, because we also know many of those applications are still uh, not aware or they have not confirmed of their physical presence or whether there will be physical space. So we're all wait and wait and see more. With this, I'm coming to our discussions for our mobilization in, in, in Glasgow. I will not go into details of this chart, but this is symbolizing what we did in the past. So we were in the blue zone, especially with uh, side events and interventions. And, and since Paris, we're in the action zone. Our first and only blue zone pavilion was in 2009 in, in Copenhagen. So this year in Glasgow, in the blue, is blue zone, we want to have a strong blue zone pavilion of LGMA. In the green zone, especially after Paris, when this concept of green zone came up, um, sorry, after Copenhagen and onwards, we were very active in the green zone in Marrakesh, in, in, in Paris, uh, in Katowice as well, um, in Glasgow, we don't know whether there will be a pavilion, but we're sure uh, there will be a huge participation. That, that chart at the end, it should not be minus, but it should be plus, 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 it's, or it's even star, star, star. In the city zone, the city of Glasgow and Scottish government are also warmly welcoming us <laughs> on the condition of the, the 
measures of COVID, but there will be a lot of events, including uh, a summit of cities and regions uh, at the city of um, Glasgow's Chamber Hall or somehow related to that. Here is a nap snapshot that this is our plan. However, let's put this, that is a, there's a caveat that this all depends on what the Bureau of COP will decide and the UK government and Scottish government will decide on how they will welcome international participants, what will be the conditions, what will be the spaces available and how they can travel with or without vaccines. One thing you may recall, uh, the World Health Organization still announced that COVID-19 pandemic will not be lifted in 2021. So the pandemic conditions prevail globally. And this is a World Health Organization issued statement. So the nationals obviously will have to abide by. Second, Tokyo Olympics is announced that it will not welcome any international audience. So there will be international participants as athletes, their trainers, referees, but there will be no audience watching this games. It will only be Japanese people or Tokyo citizens. Does this create any precedence for COP? Obviously COP is not in the scale of, of Olympics, but still there are other opportunities or options. There may be severe limitations because of the hygiene conditions. There may be restrictions because of vaccination and even vaccinations are available. Who will be eligible to this vaccines at the national level? Um, because if, if any participant is not in the priority list because of her health, his health conditions, how he or she will justify that he will get or they will get a, a vaccine, all question marks open. So let's be prepared for every option. We may expect a very, very limited number of physical prisons, huge virtual opportunities. We may expect a sequence that we are present at the moment, then we are asked to leave. So all on, on the table. Watch out the space, we have to wait and see. And last slide, this is the calendar. Uh, the the most, most, most important thing is, is the climate and ministerial development by the end of this month. Earth Day is coming up. Um, several sessions are announced. Urban 20 Summit is announced, the new dates. Um, and, and, and we'll keep more updates soon. But I know uh, we're getting to an end of our time, but I, I'd like to know Give a break. So we are trying to make sure this information available on our website. The, uh, the citiesandregions.org is the, the home of the LGMA. Um, you can find other links here. If you are not receiving any updates of LGMA, reach us to, 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 so that we can keep you informed, including our mailing list. Uh, and I thank you once again for your patience, particularly this session was a bit hard to follow because I was the only one speaking so far. Uh, I hope uh, we will have more participants in the next round. And uh, now the floor is open. Any questions, remarks, clarifications, feel free. Uh, you can type in the question box or we, we can unmute you. You can speak. Um, so um, the floor is yours. I see a number of familiar faces. I see a hand raised up. Let me see whether I can see the hand. Can you type your name into the question box? The person who, who raised his hands, I cannot see it easily. Or it may be a mistake, of course, because I don't see any hands raised anymore. Um, maybe. Computer typo that we are facing every time. It's part of life. <laughs> Hi, Serafin. Serafin, our dear colleague from COSLA, Scottish uh, Convention of Local Authorities of Scotland. Um, Serafin, it's, it's never a mistake, just a pleasure for me to, to see your interventions or engagement. We are very happy for you being our, our host. Uh, like semi-host as a COSLA, the Scottish Association. If you have any any remarks, please feel uh, free. We are very happy that you also have, have, have submitted a very strong expression of inter in, interest for the green zone and blue zone. Um, so um, if you want, you can you can 
uh, interact uh, Serafin. I see Monica, Monica Zimmerman, our dear colleague from ICLE, which governments take up the notion of multi-level COP? Um, but, well, this is a, an evolving agenda and it is also uh, changing in time. There are several governments who used to be a good friend of multi-level COP, but now they are not anymore. Um, I don't want to name them, but there are some governments who are really very good. Uh, we're very demonstrating how they are demonstrating of uh, their 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 support. These includes uh, exemplary leadership like Germany, like Canada, like Japan, Korea, Rwanda, Chile, uh, the, the 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 Dominican Republic, Peru. These are the countries that we are working through the NDCP CAEP. Um, so there's a long list. Uh, but um, sometimes it is not so easy to 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 ask them to be much more vocal. Uh, therefore, we are hoping uh, you may have received our updates before that. Uh, for the first 100 days uh, of the Biden and Harris administration, ICLA US has encouraged the, the US government to be more active in the co-chairing of the, the multi-level friends of multi-level action in the UNFCC. We are in touch with Japanese government. We are receiving very positive signals. And uh, I think it will be a question of once we see some pioneers stepping up, um, the others will follow much easily. Um, so let's see. Um, and the countries, there are several names that I didn't count here, but we're also aware that they have been traditionally a long time uh, friend of our this action. Um, yeah, I hope that was uh, clarifying your question, Monica. Um, if, if I may, um, uh, Juno, since you Please. Um, invited uh, Thomas Serafin here from, from COSLA. Well, just a first to thank you for, for this great update, as always. Uh, it's been a month uh, since we uh, haven't uh, talked. Uh, in the meantime, we have uh, put together this, this collective partnership with, uh, with yourselves and many members of the LGMA. And I think, uh, as you say, we will really not know how big, uh, in, in physical terms, COP will be. Uh, but regardless of the actual uh, logistics, we will deliver that program that we have been uh, developing together. I think the next thing is when the the, the, the the UK presidency and the UN provides like an update how they want to go forward, we we should actually get run together and, and sit down and work out uh, within the constraints of what will be uh, provided, what can we, how we maximize that. And of course, you can count us and, and the other colleagues uh, to, to, to do that as we agreed. I mean, uh, the physicality or no physicality of the event uh, and the process towards there is just uh, an incident. It's not a factor that will prevent us to actually deliver that program that we have agreed. And I'll leave it there. Thank you for, for, for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Indeed, it's a, it's a learning exercise for everyone. It, it's been a, a unique uh, condition. It has not been experienced before. It has been unprecedented. So I think the essence is that everybody should help each other. I mean, there's no one to blame here. It, it is, it's a huge responsibility for the national governments, authorities to decide something that with or without this decision, you can always say that, oh, it was a wrong decision or it should have been better. Uh, but when you're in the responsible seats, it's always a stress. Um, and they always go for the conservative options uh, to be safe, to be minimum of, of, of errors or, or uh, damages, both health, economic, and also uh, also also equity as well. Um, and a lot of also national governments, uh, those who are planning to participate, they're exploring what are the benefits to attend or not to attend. And of course, that's what we're also saying to the UNFCC. Yes, it is a priority for the parties, but never forget that Paris Agreement has opened the space to all actors of the society. So any plan for COP now take, should take into account our presence, physical presence and participation as local governments, youth, NGOs, environmental indigenous business, trade unions, indigenous people. So it cannot happen without us. That's for sure. And we are confident that UNFCC and presidencies are taking this, this uh, concerns. Uh, and we're very happy the, the hosts, um, be it UK government, be it Scottish government, be it Glasgow, and their partners like COSLA and, and other partners. We're very confident that you would uh, you would do your best to welcome us and we're very happy and, and proud to, to work with you. 
Monica has a, another question. How could we use this particular situation to call for countless local cops? Well, it could be an interesting idea, Monica. Uh, maybe you remember we had uh, Talano dialogues in 2018 that created a, a huge momentum. That was the one that breaking that was breaking the ice in terms of multi-level dialogues. Um, the Talano dialogues, as such, didn't continue, but it left a huge legacy for opening the space. We have, for example, open dialogues with the presidency. How it happens at the local level, um, obviously, when there is a global decision, it's much easier for our members to embrace and, and reflect it. Without an official decision, it may not be so easy, but nothing stops for countries or cities or regions to convene these things. As you have seen in the case of Japan, you can call it as like a local cop. I mean, we had UNFC Secretariat, UN Habitat, we had parties, UK and, and Japan at the minister level, local leaders. So the Japan Zero Carbon City Forum was in a sense a local cop. But obviously that depends on resources, that depends on uh, facilities, technicalities, the, the resources. So. Um, I think it is advisable, it, it is welcome, and we are. that's why we are mapping the list of agendas that's coming up. For example, next month we will have Rise Africa, a virtual connection in African context. In October we will have Daring Cities, but even more, the whole urban October will be on, on climate. Um, so I think, uh, or, or we have European regions, we have Climate Week, New York City, London, that is spreading. At the end of the day, this, this all depends on resources, financial resources. What I'm expecting, the moment the COP and the UNFCC announces a clear guidance how we will be or whether we will be present in Glasgow, and assuming that a huge number of us will not be going there, it may be possible to expect the preparations while going through a virtual platform, virtual pavilion that we are discussing as LGMA, we will for sure like to create a space. The connection to the COPs could be via this virtual pavilions and spaces. Um, that's why I think it is not out of reach, um, but I think we just have to wait a bit, uh, see the direction from the champions and the, sorry, from the presidency and the, the UNFC secretary. Hi, Olga. Uh, question from Olga again in Play Europe. We will also see a focus on biodiversity with the UNCBD. COP15 taking place 14 to 11, 11th to 24th of October. To this end, can we expect a deliberate bridge between COP26 and biodiversity COP26? Um, Olga, I'm not sure whether you were at, at the session when I was discussing the Edinburgh process being submitted by the UK government in collaboration with the Scottish government, and it is now an official UN biodiversity document. And I listed this as a game changer. Uh, and I've given here the link to the full decision. Uh, and we have been always praising the biodiversity process because that's the most advanced multilateral environmental process in the UN fora that recognizes or even engages local and subnational governments into the process and the more it is advanced the more it could lead the way in the other fora like climate change therefore we from ICLA said that as the LGMA this has been in our agenda uh, we're expecting this would help and this there will be a bridge there is even a, another reason the UK government who had submitted this document to the biodiversity process is the host of the COP then it's the same ministry or let's say it's the same government. And that's why we're in touch with the, both the government of UK government, but also Scottish government to recall that such a presence is taking place and encourage them to replicate, or let's say inspire and bring it to the UN by the climate space. Obviously climate has its own dynamics. It is its own challenges, its own very, very complex uh, process. Um, but we're still, hoping that there will be a lot of lessons learned 
And as you said, it is that the new dates are in October. Therefore, just two weeks before COP, if there is an impressive outcome, uh, we can expect uh, this to influence the Glasgow by the uh, climate COP as well. So we are fully uh, aiming to make this reality an inspiration or a bridge between COP and that is part of the the LGMA roadmap COP26 towards COP26 since the beginning and it's one of the core pillars of our our work um, and we now present because that document on Edinburgh Declaration came up this month so that's why we are calling it as a game changer for the 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 LGMA roadmap so, and we, we, I'd like to, on, on your behalf, uh, Holger, uh, I'd like to commend all the local Indian governments and their networks, especially ICLE regions for community of the regions. You have been tirelessly working in this agenda for so many years, not just a couple of months. So the, the success also is, is something that we have to celebrate as, as our achievement, uh, our family's uh, own success. We are very proud of your achievements and we'll look forward to your help to continue to make this uh, achievement feed into the climate space as well. So a lot of things to create synergies, a lot, a lot of opportunities for creating synergies. Okay, I feel we are coming to a, a end of the session. I already see some participants leaving us, which makes sense because just two minutes left. We don't have to stay till the end. <laughs> that we can save even two minutes is important for many of us for humanitarian break in the middle of all these Zooms, <laughs> all these virtual conferences. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for your attendance, participation, contributions, inputs. Uh, and and your your success in the delivery of all these um, agendas, uh, we are proud of the roadmap of LGMA towards a multi-level action COP in Glasgow. We are confident that we will deliver this. We are, we are confident that this Glasgow COP will be the start of a new era, uh, just like Paris did. Um, and this era will be our hope that the humanity will survive and the next generation will survive in a planet that is livable for our generation, our species, and across all the earth, and so that we can make peace with our nations, among our nations, among our cities, but make peace with nature. So with this hope, I'd like to wish you all a nice day, a nice evening, a nice afternoon. And the next webinar will be on the 21st of April, but we will provide updates. Uh, stay safe, stay cool, and stay brave and committed. So I look forward to hearing your outcomes as well. Take care. Bye-bye.